Okay, so um, maybe we can get started uh, a minute early because uh, you're about to see that we're going to need it. Um, so uh, welcome back everyone to your uh, Comp 235 tutorial. Uh, in this tutorial, we'll be, we'll be looking at the um, pumping lemma for context-free languages. Uh, and we're also going to be looking at Turing machines uh, although I doubt that we're going to have any time to look at Turing machines uh, in class. So I've already um, uh, uploaded a, a, a video on, on Moodle um, that deals with a, uh, a section, uh, that deals with the, the second section of the tutorial, which is on uh, Turing machines. So really, I think in person, we're only going to be focusing on the uh, pumping lemma for context-free languages. Uh, which is going to help you with uh, your assignment one, assignment four, uh, question one. Okay. Uh, okay. So so let's get uh, right into it. So um, like we had a a pumping lemma for regular languages, we also have a pumping lemma for uh, context-free languages. And uh, again, very similarly to that for regular languages. A pumping lemma, the pumping lemma for context free languages is only used to uh, disprove, uh, uh, disprove that L is uh, context free. So, in other words, you use the pumping lemma to uh, show L is uh, not context free. So, it's, you can never use the pumping lemma to show that a language is context free. Okay, you can only use it to show that it is uh, not context free. So what does this pumping lemma say? Uh, it, it says the following. So suppose you have a language L, uh, which, is, um, which is infinite and uh, context-free. Okay. Then there exists a positive integer M, which is known as the uh, pumping uh, length. Now this is just the pumping length for context-free languages instead of uh, regular languages. So there is this uh, positive integer m uh, such that for any string uh, in, in w and l, there is a, a decomposition of w into uh, five parts. So for regular languages, it was three parts. And now for, for context-free languages, it's five parts, uh, u, v, x, y, z, where the middle of, of this decomposition, uh, so v, x, y, has length at most m, and the length of uh, v and y together is at least one. Okay. So uh, you can decompose any uh, string, uh, any string w in any infinite context-free language l uh, into sort of into sort of this this form, such that if you pump the string up or down, so if you have wi, where wi is u v i x y i z so in this case you're going to pump the v and the y um, i times uh, and the i is going to be the same clearly for the v and the, and the y so you're pumping up or down both the v and the y's together and for any such pumping uh, you're going to get that w i is in l uh, so for every uh, i greater or equal to zero so this is what the pumping lemma says. This is just a reminder. Um, so we can sort of look at, at the problems that, that follow. So how do we use the pumping lemma um, to show that a language L is not context-free? Well, you, you do, it's, it's sort of a very similar process to um, what you did with uh, regular languages. So the first thing you do, the first thing you're going to do is you're going to assume for the sake of contradiction, that the language L, which you're trying to show is not context-free, uh, is context-free. So you're going to suppose that L is context-free, and you're going to uh, observe that L is uh, infinite. Okay, so you're observing L is infinite. Okay, so that means you can apply the pumping lemma for context-free languages. So now what you do is you pick a particular W in L, such that the length of W is at least M, where we assume M is the pumping length for context-free languages. Very important to note, 
uh, you should not pick, you must not pick a specific M. So you can't say uh, M is equal to seven or nine or 11 or whatever. Uh, this is something that people had done in the pumping lemma for regular languages. It's also not going to work for uh, context-free languages, okay? Because your M here is arbitrary. You don't know anything about M other than the fact that it exists, essentially. So you can't give M a, a specific uh, value, okay? So you pick a particular W with an arbitrary, uh, with a, a length that's greater than an arbitrary M, okay? And then uh, you take that string W and you decompose it into five components, uh, U, V, X, Y, Z, okay? And these five components should be such that uh, the length of the middle, so V, X, Y, is at most M, and the length of V and Y together is at least one. And uh, unlike in uh, regular languages, the, for the pumping lemma of regular languages, where you had, um, so as a reminder for regular languages, it was W is X, Y, Z, uh, where X, Y is at most M, and uh, Y is at least one. So it, in, in, for regular languages, it was pretty easy because uh, there is a single case, and the single case for the decomposition was your x, y was at the beginning of your of your string. But now, uh, now it gets a bit more complicated because the decomposition uh, has different possibilities. So you need to consider all possible cases, all possible uh, decompositions. And then for each of those, uh, so for, for each possible decomposition, you need to pump up or pump down using a specific uh, value for i, such that uh, wi, which is going to be, which is, is going to allow you to pump the v's and the y's the same number of times, uh, that guy wi should not be uh, in L. But you need to show this for each possible case, okay? So it's a bit more work than for uh, regular languages. And so once you've shown that WI is not an L for every possible case, then you get a contradiction. Uh, so you completely contradict the pumping lemma, you break it completely. And so you can, you can, you can, then, uh, you can then conclude that your, init your initial assumption one was false. And in fact, L uh, cannot be context-free. And that would be uh, a sufficient sort of proof for, um, for using the pumping lemma, okay? Um, so as with any kind of algorithm, it's, it's very abstract before you see an example. So to help that, let's look at an example. So we have the following uh, language L, which uh, contains strings that look like uh, an uh, bn factor, for n greater or equal to zero. And we wanna prove that this language is uh, not context-free, okay? So, um, the most the simplest way of, of doing that and probably the only way for this particular example is to use the pumping lemma okay so how do we use the pumping lemma remember the first thing you do is you assume that the language l you're trying to show is not context free you assume that in fact uh, l is context free okay so for the sake of contradiction uh, then because this n here is uh, unbounded uh, this implies this implies that the language L is infinite, okay? Because you can you can you can uh, have any number of, of strings in in L, okay? So uh, it, it, it's infinite. So because L is context free and it's infinite, we can now apply the pumping lemma for context free languages on L, okay? So so that was step one. Uh, the second step is you want to pick a particular string w in l uh, remember such that uh, w is at least m where here we're again assuming that m is the pumping length for context-free languages okay so you want to pick a particular w here a very simple a very easy pick is just replacing the n by the m here so uh, instead of a n b n factorial, you have a m. So you have a m 
B M factorial. Okay. Um, clearly, the the length of W is at least M because you have at least M A's. So the pick for 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 W is is at least so far it's correct. Now we're going to see why it's going to help us in uh, disproving in disproving that L is uh, context free. Okay. So remember uh, for step three, you need to decompose W. So you need to decompose W into U V uh, X Y. Okay. Uh, such that the um, oh sorry u v x y z such that the length of v x y is at most uh, m and the length of v y which uh, for sort of the rest of this problem we're going to denote as k is at least one okay so we want all of the all of the decompositions all of the possible decompositions uh, where uh, this kind of these kinds of parameters hold okay so what are those possible decompositions well the the first two are, are quite straightforward uh, the first one is essentially where you have your v x y so your middle string here your middle string here is only going to contain a's so we see here that uh, v x y is among the uh, m a's okay so uh, we have that vxy is at most m because it's it's among the uh, ma's and uh, we're going to assume that the sort of length of, of v with y is at least one okay so in this case this means that uh, vy together if we assume that the length of vy is k vy together looks like uh, a k so k number of a's so now it, it's going to be quite easy to pump up or pump down to get a contradiction for this case. What you can do is you can pick uh, i is equal to two. So remember, if you pick i is equal to two, uh, you're picking w2, which is uh, going to be u v2 x y2 z. So what you're doing really, what you're doing when you pump up from i equals one to two, you're you're adding so you add uh, vy to w1 okay in this case vy is just uh, ka's so you're going to add ka's to the uh, already ma's that you have so you already have ma's because that's your string w w is a m v m factorial and then to, zo to those ma's you're going to add ka's okay so the resulting string W2, the resulting pumped string W2 uh, looks like uh, looks like A M plus K B M factor. Okay. Now the only thing that's left to do is for this particular case, you want to show that W2 is not in L. Okay. But for a string to be, so let me just for a string to be in L, then the number of A's the or sorry the number of b's should equal the factorial the factorial of the number of a's okay <clears throat> so um is that true in this case so what we're what we're trying is what we're trying to check we're trying to check if the number of b's factorial is equal to the number of a's in this case m plus k uh, factorial and in fact, you can see that this is not going to be true. And the reason for that is because um, K is at least one and M is uh, positive. So if K is at least one and M is at least positive, then M plus K uh, factorial is going to be uh, at least uh, M plus one factorial. And for, uh, for M strictly greater than zero, m plus 1 factorial is going to be strictly greater than uh, m factorial okay so we see that m plus k factorial is in fact not equal uh, to m factorial okay or in other words the number of the number of of b's is not equal to the number of a's factorial so this means that w2 does not respect uh, the definition of l 
So this means that W2 is not an L, okay? So W2 is not an L. And this shows that for case one, for the case where VXY are within all of the A's, uh, you get a, a contradiction. So that completes uh, case one. The second case is uh, a bit similar. Uh, is similar, just a bit, uh, slightly different reasoning. So instead of having VXY within the uh, A's, what you have is you have the, the VXYs uh, being within the B's, okay? So um, you're going to assume that the sort of the total length of VXY is at most M and that the length of V and Y is at least a B. So here we see that VY together is uh, something like VK. So a bunch of Bs uh, where K is greater or equal to one. So now here again, if we pump up with I equals to two, then uh, what happens is, remember W2 is U, V2, X, Y2, Z. So what you're doing is you're adding uh, you're adding KBs because VY has KBs. You're adding uh, KBs to the already uh, M factorial Bs that there are in the string W1, okay? Because you're pumping from W1 to W2. So you're adding KBs from W1 to W2. So uh, now the only thing left to do now that you've pumped is you need to check that W2 is not in L. This is going to be true because remember, for a string to be an L, uh, the number of Bs should be equal to the number of A's factorial. So if you take the number of A's factorial, you should see it should, it should in fact be true that uh, M factorial is equal to M factorial uh, plus K. Okay. But because K is at least one, this is not true because m factorial plus k is going to be actually strictly greater than m factorial, okay? So um, that, that would be, that would, so the fact that m factorial plus k is strictly greater than m factorial tells us that uh, this guy here does not respect the, the definition of L. And so uh, W2 is not in, in L, okay? So question, Simon, um, you, so uh, it is similar, but it's not exactly, exactly the same argument. You, in my opinion, you would only be able to say uh, similar and that's it, if you would be able to only replace letters. So if, for example, uh, case two was exactly the same as case one, except that instead of AB, you would have a CA, uh, then, then that's probably fine. That, that for to me, that seems like it is exactly one to one similar. But in this case, it's a bit different because the argument here is actually different because here um, it's not entirely the same. Okay. Uh, the second question. So for case two, can we disqualify it by showing that V must have an A in it? Why must V have an A in it? So I picked, wait, let me read the rest of your question. Um, v must have an A in it so we can pop up A's or else it will only hold true. Um, so case two is VXY contains only B's. Okay, so uh, you can't claim that uh, V must have an A because here I'm decomposing it. I'm, I'm looking at all the cases. And in this particular case, I have that V is only a bunch of Bs. So um, it's not in fact true that V must have an A in it because this is a different case. So it's true here. Um, and that's why you could pump up and get sort of a different number of uh, sort of a, a contradiction in, in the definition here. But in, in this case here, the Vs contain only, the V contains only the Bs, okay? so. It's a, it's, a, it's a proper sort of very distinct case. So you couldn't, you, you would need to reason um, about it differently. Okay, so I, I hope that answers your question. Um, maybe it'll be clear once you see the, the, the other cases, okay? Because we're not done. 
So, um, so far what we've seen, we've seen a VXY. So we've seen the, we've seen VXY only in the A's and we've seen VXY only in the B's. Okay. The next thing that, that could happen is the V's could, the V could be in the B's, uh, sorry, the V can be in the A's and the Y could be in the B's. So what I mean by that is here, the V could be in the A's. And here the Y could be in the B's. Okay, so that's another possibility. And then in the middle, your X could be uh, a bunch of A's and then a bunch of B's. Okay, so you you still have the possibility that V X Y is at most M. Okay, and again, you're going to claim that uh, V Y is at least one. Okay, here within the case, there are actually uh, sub cases that once you eliminate them, they're going to make your life, uh, in my opinion, a, a lot easier. There might be a different way of sort of reasoning about this problem. I think this is, this is the best way. Um, so what I mean, what I mean by subcases is, you know now that V is, let's say A to the K1. So because your V, your V is within the A's, it has K1 A's. And you know that your Y has, uh, K, let's say K2Bs, okay? So uh, V has K1As, Y has K2Bs, and together, you know that K2, uh, K1 plus K2, so uh, this is equal to uh, the length of VY. This is between one, uh, and it's also going to be at most M. It's at most M because of this restriction, okay? But really, don't don't try to, don't, don't get too confused by the fact that I have a K1 and K2 here. K1 is just the length of V and K2 is just the length of Y, okay? So um, now that you've identified what V and, and Y look like, what are, what are their representations? Then what you can do is you can say, what if, uh, what if K2 uh, was equal to zero? Meaning that you had absolutely no Bs in your Y then the only thing that you control, the only thing that you pump up or down are the A's, okay? That's the only thing that you're pumping up or down. And then in this case, I do agree that you could say that this is exactly, in fact, the same as case one. And it's in fact exactly the same because the argument would be uh, uh, sort of one for one, exactly the, the same, okay? Because here, uh, here you, you were pumping the A's, and here as well, you're just going to pump the A's. So, so that's why when, when the Y contains no B's, it's similar to case one. Then if uh, the length of V is zero or K1 is zero, so V has uh, no A's. So the other case would be V has no A's. So just pretend that's, that's empty. Then the only thing you pump up or down is going to be the B's. But that's exactly the same as uh, case two over here or up here. And that's because for case two, the only thing you were doing is you were pumping, so let me clean this up. The only thing you were doing is you were pumping the Bs. So it doesn't matter if the Bs contained were, were composed of the V and the Y, you were still just pumping the Bs. So the idea is exactly the same. And so you can say that this is the same as case two. So now that you've eliminated those kind of edge cases, those corner cases, what you can go to now is you can go to when K1 and K2 uh, are both non-zero or are positive. So suppose K1 is greater or equal to one and K2 is greater or equal to one. Okay, so that means that your V has some A's and your Y has some B's then the argument becomes a, a little more uh, interesting and a, a little more uh, sort of mathematically uh, rigorous kind of. Uh, and, and the reason why I say that is because no matter how you pump, you could pump down or up, uh, you need to show, so for instance here, I'm going to pick I equals to two, and now I'm going to pump up. So what that means is uh, to my A's, so this is my list of A's, I'm going to add, I'm going to add an additional Y 
Y contains K1As, so it's going to have, so to the existing MAs, you're going to add K1As. That's for the V. Because you're pumping V and Y with exactly the same I, the uh, existing number of Bs, in this case B factorial, is also going to receive an addition of Bs. That addition of Bs is going to come from the additional Y, which is of length K2. So you're adding uh, K2 Bs to the already M factorial Bs, right? So that's why when you pump up, uh, when your string W2 looks like A M plus K1, B M factorial plus K2. And now this is where it, it actually, you have to use some, some, some math. So I would argue that at this point, it's no longer COM335, it's more like discrete math. And so what you need to show essentially is you need to show that uh, the number of A's factorial is not equal to the number of, of B's. Uh, in this case, you can actually see that the number of A's, uh, the number of A's factorial, is in fact strictly greater than uh, the number of Bs, okay? So this is the number of As, and this is the number of Bs. So there's one reason, uh, there's one way of sort of uh, reasoning about this. Uh, hopefully you're not going to get lost in this argument. If you do, don't get too worried because um, this is really, if you get the idea, if you were just to say something like this, I wouldn't really push you for a sort of concrete, full, in-depth proof if you sort of just observe that this was true, okay? But if you want to be completely convinced, um, yeah, okay. So if you want to, let me, let's not, let's not talk about discrete math. Uh, if, if you want to be completely con convinced and you want to show this, okay, uh, then M plus K1 uh, factorial, what you know about K1, you know that K1 is, um, K1 is uh, strictly greater than zero, so it's at least one. So you know that uh, K1 is at least one, so M plus K1 factorial is at least M plus one uh, factorial, okay? So far, I, I hope that's, that's clear. M plus one factorial, that can just be written as M plus one times M factorial by definition. Then, uh, now, if you want an intuition of where this is headed, you want to get, at some point, a strict uh, inequality so that you get that uh, this guy is strictly greater than uh, M factorial plus K2. So you want to get a, a strict inequality somewhere and end up with M factorial plus K2. Right? That's the idea. So I'm going to leave M factorial plus K2 here. And I'm going to uh, continue my reasoning. So I'm only, I'm going to sort of expand this. I'm going to get M, M factorial plus M factorial. Okay. Um, and then what I can observe is, uh, I can observe that if I know that M is at least one, so M times M factorial is greater than or equal to M factorial. So you have M factorial plus M factorial is at most uh, this guy. So now what, what, what has happened is I have essentially the first column of what I'm looking for. The second column is I want to show that M factorial is strictly greater than K2. Okay, that's, that's how I'm, I'm reasoning about it. Okay, so how do I do that? Well, the next thing I can observe is uh, I know that uh, so I'm going to keep the M factorial because it's going to pair with this guy. But I know that M factorial is at least greater or equal to M, right? M factorial is greater or equal to M. So M factorial plus M factorial is greater or equal to M factorial plus M, okay? And this is actually very important to, to notice because now what you can use, you can use the fact that uh, because K1 plus K2 is at most M, uh, and uh, you know that K1 is at least one, then that means that K2 has to be at most M minus one, okay? So one way that you can, that you can show this 
uh, one way that you can reason about this is that uh, uh, if k2 were m, then k1 would be empty. But uh, I assumed here that k1 is not empty. So I know that k2 has to be at most m minus 1. Okay. So why was this useful to, to notice? Because now I know that m is strictly greater than uh, m minus 1. That's, that's true sort of for n, any m. Okay, and then I know that m factorial plus m minus one is because of this inequality is greater than or equal to m factorial plus k2. Okay. And then so you've shown, so now you've shown that m plus k1 factorial is strictly greater than to m factorial plus k2. Um, so that would allow you to, to claim that w2 is not in L. Again, if you didn't really follow the details or, or the steps of, of this part of the proof, it's not really the end of the world. Uh, it's just because uh, if I didn't show it, I know a lot of people would say, oh, why is this true? So I did bother to, to show it instead. Um, yeah, so this is definite. So this is not a proof by induction. It's just sort of a proof using, using inequalities. Um, kind of a sort of classic inequality proof. Um, so that's for case three. Well, that's a, that's a, that's a lot of questions. Okay, maybe I, I want to finish this question because uh, uh, this example. So then I'll, I'll answer your questions when I finish uh, this example. Uh, the next two cases are actually quite uh, easy to get a grasp on. There's no re real need for inequalities. And that's because what you assume is you now assume that the V contains the A's and then followed by the B's. So your V has uh, some A's and then some B's, okay? And then sort of the rest of your string, the rest of XY contains B's, okay? So the reason why this is uh, an easy kind of case is because first of all, if V is zero, so if V is empty, then the only thing you can, you can pump is the B's. And this is the same as case two. Otherwise, if, if uh, the V is non-empty, so it has at least one. So forget about this. This is a bit uh, confusing like notation. I don't like it myself. The only thing you could really say, you could sort of say this in a, in a kind of one line or sentence is if you were to pump um, your string W at least sort of uh, uh, once. So if you were to pick I equals to two, and you knew that your string contained uh, some A's and then some B's, then what you would get, your, your resulting pumped string would look like some A's, and then uh, the first V, so that would be some, some A's and then some B's, and then the second V, some A's and then some B's. Okay, and then you would have more B's, all right? So this would be your V, and this would be your, your, your second V. But this is not in L, not because of a kind of inequality reasoning. Reasoning, it's just because it doesn't have the structure, the same structure as strings in L. Because here we see that we have A's and then B's. So we have A's and then B's and then again A's. Okay. So that would essentially break what uh, a string in L should look like. So that would essentially show you that for case four, you don't have... Um, you, you don't have the pumping lemma holding, okay? The last really possible case is if instead the V contains the A's and the B's, it's the Y that contains the A's and the B's. But then the argument is uh, exactly the same as case four. So, so you could just say that the argument is, is really identical. And so now that you've essentially exhausted all possible cases, and shown that for each possible case, there is a particular i, such that wi is not an L, then this shows that uh, you've arrived at a contradiction. And so your initial assumption is incorrect and L must not be uh, context-free, okay? So that would, that would allow you to, to, to finally disprove that this guy is context-free. Okay, so uh, while I answer some questions, maybe, you could take, uh, how are we doing? Okay, very bad. Maybe you could take one minute to uh, uh, look at this exercise. 
uh, as kind of a hint, I think that what you would do, uh, what you should do is try to list, uh, list the cases. Don't really get bogged down in, in sort of uh, pumping up or down. Just try to list all the cases you can think of and we'll go over it uh, together. So, um, okay, so actually in discrete math, yeah, let's, um, yeah, that was, maybe I shouldn't have mentioned discrete math. Sorry about that. Uh, to, okay, so WX was, I think you were just answering a question. Um, oh, I see. I think you were still just answering a question, right? There might be other possibilities. Yeah, I think it, it seems like you were just answering a question. Correct me if I'm wrong, um, if I didn't answer a question. And Vincent, if we happen to forget one subcase, uh, yes, you would definitely get partial marks. Um, okay, so that's, yeah, I, yeah, I don't, yeah. So not every marker is the same, unfortunately, but I would definitely give you uh, part marks uh, for that. Um, and I, I really should, I, I also told the other markers that they should give part marks for that. So that, that's unfortunate. Um, but yes, uh, in the section that I'm correcting, you will definitely get, and I'll also tell the other markers to be a bit more lenient because uh, of course it's very difficult to sort of list all the cases. Um, but but uh, yeah, that's, so I'll, I'll actually, I'll, let me just write that quickly so I don't forget. Um, okay. Okay. So, um, okay, so for the, the people that didn't ask questions, I hope you were listing all the cases because that's what I'm going to do for the next uh, 20 minutes. Um, so we wanna prove that the language L, which is over the alphabet ABC, uh, where the number of A's is exactly the same as the number of B's, and the number of A's and B's is strictly greater to the number of C's, we wanna show that this language is uh, not context-free. So how do we do that? Well, again, like in the example, we assume for the sake of contradiction that L is, L is not uh, context-free. Oh, sorry, well, that, I mean, you've already proved it if you assume that, that L is context-free, sorry about that. So you assume for contradiction that L is context-free. The second thing you need to do is you need to pick a string W. So you pick a string W in L, such that the length of W is at least M, where in this case, M is going to be the pumping uh, length, okay? Um, so what's a good pick for, for, um, for W in this case? Well, what you need to kind of think of is, you've already seen in the lecture, the proof for uh, A, N, B, N, uh, C, N, not being um, uh, not being context free, okay. So um, the idea is the string that you pick uh, for for this kind of uh, language uh, should be or can be similar to this structure, because you already know the the basics or the fundamentals to uh, disproving that something like this is uh, context free. Okay, so um, what I'm going to do then to pick my string W is I know that my A's and B's should be strictly greater than my C's. So if, for example, I pick C as being M, okay, then what I can do for the A's and B's is I can pick A M plus one, uh, B uh, M plus one. And this is going to actually be a, a very useful pick for my, um, my pumping of, of, of A's and B's. Yeah, so, so I agree that picking is the hardest part. Um, the sort of the main trick that uh, I would suggest is trying to see if, if this, if, your if the language that you're, you're dealing with, that you're tackling with, um, is kind of a, a superset or sort of a, a bigger language than something that you've already uh, already seen and already disproved. Um, like for example, if this was, so uh, 
this is a bit off topic. Um, but for example, if you were trying to show that um, Na uh, is equal to, for example, um, Nb factorial, something like this, and you wanted to show that that wasn't uh, uh, context free, uh, then uh, because you've already seen something like uh, m, like the number of, of, of b's or the number of a's is the factorial of something else, namely this example here, then I would try to sort of reduce that down um, to, to, to a structure that you've already seen. Okay. So, so essentially the tip is try to, uh, in this case when it's very general, when it's a very general language, try to reduce it um, to the number of, of uh, sorry, not, not to the number, try to reduce it to a, a structure that you've already seen. So uh, for example, in this case, you could pick uh, something like A M factorial B M. Okay, that's, uh, that's the um, idea. Okay, so Marcus, I'm not, I, I know that that's the assignment question. I'm not gonna answer that, okay? Um, but I, I mean, I'm doing a, an example that's quite similar. So I, I feel like it, that's, that's pretty fair, okay? Um, so, uh, so what do I have here? So I have W, so I picked my W as a m plus one b m plus one c m okay um, I know that that's probably the hardest part really practice and also trying to recognize part patterns that's that's probably the best way to go um, so now that you've picked w what you need to do uh, so for three what you need to do is uh, you need to decompose decompose uh, w uh, into uh, five components u uh, uv, x, y, z, okay, where uh, you know that v, x, y is at most m and v, y is at least one, okay. So um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to write what the string uh, w looks like so I can, because I'm going to use this a lot. Um, so that's my string w. Uh, so there's a bunch of cases where uh, there's a bunch of decomposition cases. The first one that you can you can think of is um, so I'm going to do this uh, not as formally as it should be, but in your assignments, uh, please make it a bit more uh, sort of formal. So a lot more like uh, this example here, where it's it's super sort of crystal clear. Um, but for the purposes of time, I'm going to uh, go a bit faster. Okay, so the first case would be, uh, or in fact, the first three cases is uh, VXY is within the A's, within the B's, and within the C's, okay? So if your VXY is within the A's, okay, your VXY is uh, within the A's, so you know that uh, VY is equal to uh, AK for some K greater or equal um, to one, then what you can do is you can either pump uh, up. If you pump up, then you're, get, you're going to get the number of A's uh, greater than the number of B's. So that's going to be a contradiction. You can also pump down and get that uh, the number of, of A's is less than or equal to the number of C's. So for, for this first case, I'm going to pump uh, up. I'm going to use I equals to two. That's going to be W2 as uh, UV2X, y two z okay so what's what's going to happen is I'm going to add k uh, a's uh, k a's to my existing m plus one a's so that's going to be a m plus one m plus one sorry m plus one plus k b m plus one and then c m and so we see that uh, because k is greater or equal to one m plus one plus k is strictly greater than m plus one so that means that W2 is not going to be an F. Again, uh, don't do this in your assignment, make it a bit more formal, uh, but uh, I, I can already tell that I'm going to run out of time, so that's why I'm going a bit faster, okay? The second case is uh, uh, very similar. Actually, the second case would be, um, so let me, let me just show you. So the second case would be almost exactly the same, so you have your VXY are within the Bs, okay? 
And then instead of this being an A, and instead of uh, sort of the M plus one plus K being on the A, it's going to instead be on the B, okay? So in this case, I agree, you could say uh, similar uh, to uh, case one, okay? And uh, I would let you off the hook, that would be enough to do case two, okay? Because it's true that it's, it's actually like copy paste uh, the same thing other than just changing the A for a B, okay? So that's for when VXY is within the Bs, okay? Um, the other possibility, so the other possibility, which is not really the same as case one, is when the, uh, the VXY is within the Cs, okay? So if the VXY is within the Cs, then you have to be more careful if you pump up or down. So uh, why? Because now VY is, is going to be equal to uh, CK for some K greater or equal to one, okay? Um, now, if I pump down, so um, if I pump down, uh, then uh, I'm not going to arrive, so it's not going to lead to a, a contradiction, okay? And the reason why it's not going to lead to a contradiction is I'm just removing more Cs from my string, so this is going to stay true, the, the inequality, and you're not touching the A's or the B's, so the equality is going to remain the same. So you actually need to pump up, and for example, you can pick i equals to two. So if you pick i equals to two, again, I'm sorry that this, this has become a, a sort of more loose than the other example, uh, but if you pick i equals to two, then you get w2 as x, y2, z, or no, sorry, oh, uh, u, v2, x, y2, z, which is going to be equal to what? Uh, a, uh, m plus one, b, m plus one, uh, c, m plus k. And now you know that k is at least one. So that means that m plus k is greater than or equal to m plus one, right? Because you have at least one, uh, one, one in the k. So m plus k is at least greater than uh, m plus one. Uh, so th it's going to kind of uh, break uh, this condition here that the number of c should be strictly less than the number of v's. So this guy is not going to be in, in L either. So that's going to break it for uh, case uh, three, okay? So uh, the next case, case four, um, is going to be one where, oh no, I said, oh, damn it. okay. So it's going to, sorry, I, I copied the slide instead of pasting it, so now I have to rewrite this. Aye, aye, aye. Um, so now, your string, which is a bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, a bunch of C's, okay? Uh, the, the other thing you can do now is instead of only having your V and the Y be in the same symbol, now you can let the V and the Y be uh, within two different symbols. So um, what I mean by that is, um, let's say you have your V uh, within the A's, and then your, your Y within the Bs, and then the X is in the middle, okay? So um, what I'm going to assume is, I'm going to assume that uh, the length of V is greater than zero, and the length of Y is greater than zero, okay? Because uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise what happens, this is going to be the same as, for example, if the length of V is zero, uh, you have no Vs here, so then you're just going to pump the Bs. So that's the same as case two. Uh, if instead you have the length of Y zero, so you have no Bs here, then you're only going to pump the As, so that's similar uh, to case one. So otherwise, you could say that if either of these are equal to zero, it's this, are equal to zero, it's the same as case one or two, okay? So I'm assuming that both of them have, have positive lengths. So um, let's say V has length K1 and Y has length K2. So now V looks like A K1 and Y looks like B K2, okay? So now I can either pump up or pump down. Pumping up is actually not going to lead to a, a contradiction. So I'm going to have to uh, pump 
down, okay? Using i equals to zero, okay? Um, what is i equals to zero? Well, it's just w zero, which is uh, u v zero x y zero uh, z. So this, uh, what this is, is you're going to uh, take the a's, so you're going to take the a's in your string uh, w1, and you're going to remove from it uh, k1a's. So you're going to start with m plus 1 a's, and you're going to remove k1a's. Uh, the same thing uh, for uh, the b's, you're going to remove k2b's, and the c's, you're going to have m of those. Okay. Um, so now what you need to notice is there's one condition that breaks and that condition is going to be the fact that now the number of C's, which is M, is greater or equal, greater or equal to the number of B's because uh, if you take M plus 1 and you remove K2 from it, you know that K2 is, uh, so where is it, K2 is greater than 0, so it's at least 1. So if you take uh, m plus 1 and you remove from it at least 1, so this is uh, at least 1, then it's going to be at most m, okay? Because you could at least, you can in the best case only remove 1 from it, so it can be at most m, okay? So then because of this condition, this is not going to be in L. So that's going to break uh, that case, okay? So I hope you're, you're still with me. I know uh, uh, it's getting a bit tedious, um, but I wanna do it sort of exhaustively because you'll, you'll see that that's really what you have to do for the assignment. So that's for case four. The other case now is, uh, is the same argument, except that now the Vs are going to be, uh, the V is going to be in the Bs and the Y is going to be in the Cs. Okay. But other than that, it's, it's quite similar. So you have, uh, what is this, case five? You have uh, W1 as A, B, and C. Okay, so you have um, the, the V contains Bs, the Y contains Cs, and in the middle you have the Xs, okay? So again, I'm going to assume that the length of V uh, is greater than zero and the length of Y is greater than zero because otherwise, Otherwise, if either of these are zero, uh, if either of these are, are zero, then it reduces to, again, cases two or three in this case. Because, for example, if, if the length of V is zero, then V ha is empty. So then the only thing you can do is pump the Cs. So that would be uh, um, case three, because then you're just pumping the Cs. If instead the V, uh, if instead the V is not empty, but the Y is empty, then this reduces the pumping the Vs, okay? So if you're just pumping the, the Vs, then that's the same as uh, case uh, two. Because in case two, we are, even though the VXY was in the Bs, the only thing we were pumping was uh, the Bs. So it doesn't really matter that the Y in this case is empty it's again going to be the same argument. Where it's not going to be the same argument is when both of these are greater than zero. So maybe I'll answer that question at the same time as I'm, I'm doing this, is I'm going to set the length of V as K1, and I'm going to set the length of Y as K2. This is not the same as the exponent for uh, V and Y. This is the length this is the initial length of V, okay? I don't know what the initial length of V is. The I is different. That's the, the, the I is the one that's used to, to see how many times you're going to pump the Vs and the Ys, which is the same for both, okay? Um, so you're setting the length of V. The, so this is the length of V, not the pumping length. You're setting the length of V as K1, which is greater or equal to one and you're setting the length of y as k2, which is greater or equal to one. By the way, you could have picked any letter. I just picked k1, k2, just because, uh, just because, but you could have picked anything else. So there was no specific reason why it was k1 or k2, okay? But now that I have v as k1, uh, length of v as k1 and length of y as k2, 
now I can, uh, I, I can pump up and I know I can pump up or down and I know what my resulting string is going to look like. So uh, in this case, I can, uh, let's, yeah, let's, let's pump up again. So if we pump up and we pick i is equal to two, then what is that going to look like? It's going to look like w2 as u v2 x y2 um, z. So again, i is the exponent of v and y. So the v, you're going to add an extra v to your string. So you're going to add an extra k1 b's to your string. So uh, the a's remain unchanged, but to your b's, you're going to add an extra uh, k1, okay? Because the k1 is the length of v, and so the k1 is the length of v, which is within the b's. You're pumping up, so you're adding an extra v, so you're adding an extra k1 uh, b's to uh, the existing m plus one b's. And you do the same thing for the c's. For the c's, you have your existing uh, m c's, and you add to that k2. And this is not, Going to be an L for two reasons. The what, the first the the reason I'm going to identify is that uh, m plus one is now actually strictly less than uh, m plus one plus k one because I I've assumed that k one is at least one. Another reason would be for the length of c's and a's, but I I'm not really going to get into that. But that would be another another argument. Okay. But here you see that the length of a the number of a's is strictly less than the number of b's. So uh, this assumption is broken, okay? So that would allow you to, uh, to get a contradiction for case five. So, so far, so, so good. Well, I, I hope so far, so good. Um, the last couple of cases are going to be where um, your v contains not just one symbol, it contains uh, two symbols. So your v could contain both a and b, uh, both a and b, and your v could contain both b and c. And the argument would be the same if it was the y. So if the y would contain a and b, or the y would contain b and c, you would essentially argue the same way. So I'm only going to do that, I'm only going to do it for v. Okay, okay, so um, thank you for, for bearing with me. Um, let's so, so case six, I have uh, w1 as uh, a bunch of a's, and then a bunch of b's, and then a bunch of c's, okay? So my v now, what I'm going to pick for my v is it's going to be, uh, it's going to contain the a's and then the b's, okay? So then the x is going to be here and the y is going to be somewhere in the b's, okay? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to assume that the length of v is greater than zero because otherwise, again, uh, if this, so if this is zero, if your V contains nothing, then you're only going to pump the Bs. So then this is like case uh, two. Okay, so, um, well, uh, otherwise, sorry. So otherwise, probably just should have written else, who's a computer scientist here, but otherwise, this is like case two, okay? So um, I know that the length of V is uh, greater than zero. In fact, the length of V has to be at least one. So now I'm not going to give you a kind of explicit uh, uh, structure because it's going to get very messy if I do that. But what you need to notice is if, for example, I, <clears throat> sorry, if, for example, oh, well, in this case, if I pump down, uh, and in fact, pumping up is uh, not always going to work. Um, try to think uh, why, and, and I'll, I'll, I'll answer that in a few seconds. Uh, you're going to pump down, and you're going to pick i as uh, zero, okay? When i is zero, then w zero is u, v zero y, uh, sorry, u, v zero x, y zero z, okay? So when you have a, a pick like this, what's happening is, and now I'm just going to write this in words because it, it, it would become very messy if I, if I use uh, explicit variables. So you're removing uh, at least uh, one A or 
uh, one B. So you're removing at least one A from here or at least one B from here. So what does that mean? That means that the number of A's, okay, the number of A's is going to be at most M or the number of B's is going to be at most M, okay? But that would imply, that would imply that either the number of C's is at least, uh, is at least greater than the number of A's or uh, the number of C's. So this isn't an exclusive or, it could be both, uh, but it could also be that the number of C's is greater or equal to the number of B's, okay? In either case, okay, in either case, uh, this condition that the number of C's is strictly less than the number of A's and B's would uh, no longer be true. So then uh, you would get that, uh, you would, this would imply that W0 is not in L, okay? Um, and so I, I said that pumping up would not work. And the reason why pumping up would not work is you don't know how many A's and how many B's are in the V. So you don't know how many A's and B's are in the V. If there are exactly the same number of A's and B's in the V, then if you pump up, you would just increase the number of A's and B equally. So then uh, this would remain true and this inequality would remain true. So pumping down is actually the only uh, sort of thing that could happen, the only way that you could get a contradiction in this case, okay? No, excuse me? Yes. Can I clarify the last statement? Uh, um, um, about the AB that you cannot pump up. Yeah. So the way I see it, if you pump up, you will increase the number of ABs. So you mm -hmm. would have substrings of AB, 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 AB. So that would break the inequality. Ah, but they're equal. Yeah. It, oh. Exactly. Yeah. So that so that's kind of a trap. You would get AB, 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 but here there's no uh, structure implied. So it's not like where you have A N B N. Uh, the fact that you have A, B, A, B uh, doesn't directly mean that uh, W0 is not in L. Um, oh, I see. Okay. Makes sense. Yeah. yeah thanks yeah. a lot. No problem. So yeah, that's why, that's why this case, this kind of example is trickier um, because here you don't know, you don't really have a explicit form. But that was a, that was a great uh, uh, question. Um, so that's, that's case uh, six, the last case. Um, is when instead of the V containing the A's and the B's, the V contains B's and C's. So that's here, okay? And the argument is going to be quite similar. Um, so again, you're going to have W1 as a bunch of A's, a bunch of B's, and then a bunch of C's, okay? But now your V is here, okay? Um, so where's your, your X is here and your Y is here, okay? So, uh, again, you're going to assume that V is greater than, than strictly greater than zero. Otherwise, so else uh, it would be sort of uh, the same as only pumping C's. So only pumping C's is the same as case uh, three, okay? So you know that uh, V is uh, uh, non-zero, so it's strictly greater than zero. It has at least uh, one, one symbol in it. So now it's going to be, again, a, a similar uh, argument where I'm not going to give you an explicit form because it's going to, again, get messy. Uh, but here you could actually pump up or pump down. Either case would work. Um, what did I do? Yeah. So in this case, let, let me try to pump up. So if I pump up, that means, so let's say I pick i equals to 2, then I get w2 as uh, u, v2, x, y2, z. So I'm adding an extra V to my string uh, a W1. So that means I'm either, uh, either uh, increasing the uh, number of Bs or, so this is my arrow, up arrow for increasing, or uh, increasing the number of, of uh, Cs, okay? Because uh, it, it's not an exclusive or, it could be both, uh, but I could increase the number of Bs in which case, so if I increase the number of Bs, then the number of Bs is going to be greater than the number of As. That's going to be a contradiction. Or if I increase the number of Cs, uh, then the number of Cs is going to be greater or equal to the number of As um, or, or Bs, 
Okay, it, it could be it could be either because you're not really controlling anything there. But uh, these are essentially the only two possibilities. They're not uh, mutually exclusive. That is, this isn't an exclusive or it could both could happen. Uh, but in, in either case, if either uh, happens, if either of the two happens, then uh, W2 is not going to be an L because both of these uh, violate uh, this condition. Okay. So um, the other really, the other cases could be if instead of the V, this was a Y. Uh, and uh, here, instead of the V, that was a Y. But you can see that that would exactly be the same. You would use exactly the same argument, so I'm not even going, I'm not even going to include it. This is exhaustive enough. So um, uh, since uh, for every case uh, we arrive at a contradiction, so this is my symbol for contradiction. Um, this implies that L is uh, not uh, context-free. So then this would be a, an exhaustive pumping lemma proof. That would allow you to show that L is not uh, uh, context free. Okay, question from uh, uh, C. Um, uh, but it should also include the form and the n c n minus one. Um, you, uh, I'm not quite sure what you mean by. So um, a, a, an important thing about the pumping lemma is. Uh, you pick a, a particular string. So it's a particular W. So yes, it's possible that A, N, B, N, C, or in this case, A, M, B, M, C, M minus uh, one is in, in L, but you have the choice of what string you pick. So it doesn't matter if uh, for that string, these arguments won't work. I picked a particular string where the arguments do work, so that's enough to show that the pumping lemma does not hold. Um, I don't know if that I don't know if that was the question. Uh, yes, but it also must include this type of string. No, yes, but again, you're picking a um, particular. So you're picking a particular W. Um, so it doesn't matter if it doesn't matter if the argument breaks. So if the argument does not hold for in this case a m b m c m minus one. If you can find at least one, at least one string where uh, you can go through this process, so all of this process, and arrive at contradictions for each case, then it disproves the, so you get a contradiction because uh, the pumping, because it should apply for every string according to the pumping lemma. So because you've identified one string that doesn't work, uh, then one string is enough and, um, it shows that the pumping lemma breaks. Okay. Um, so yeah. So I agree that if you were to pick a m b m c m minus one, it wouldn't work. But that's why that that wouldn't be a a good. So it wouldn't be the best pick because there would be some cases where uh, it won't it won't work. Okay. Um, so that's why you need to be careful in your picking of w's. Okay. So um, all right. So I'm already out of time. Maybe. Uh, Okay, I, th this example should take, uh, should be fairly quick, so I, I'm going to do it uh, quickly. Um, there's essentially an idea that I wanna show you behind it. Really. Okay, I have no idea what happened. Um, uh, let me quickly. Okay. What the heck? Uh, share screen. And this. Okay. All right. Uh, yes, I did cut out. Uh, that's very unfortunate. Okay, sorry about that. Uh, I got a network error for some reason. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe uh, the question for D, um, when checking all the cases, uh, for each case, you need to get a contradiction. Um, yeah, exactly. Very good, Ryan. That's exactly what you're saying. Um, so so you, should, you should 
be able uh, to, to derive a contradiction for every possible case. If you don't have a contradiction for all the cases, then that means that, uh, then that probably means that your pick for W wasn't correct, or you're not, or maybe your pumping wasn't correct. So maybe you should uh, rethink your pumping. Okay. But so uh, quickly, I want to do this question because there's an important result that uh, follows from it. So you want to show that the language a n square is not context free. Uh, so again, you assume that L is context free. You know that it is uh, infinite. Okay. Uh, then the second thing you do is you pick a, a string W and L. In this case, very naturally, you can pick a m square. So you pick W as a m square for uh, where m is the pumping uh, length. Okay. Uh, okay, that does not look like a th, but it is. Um, and then uh, you need to pump, you need to find contradictions for every possible case, for every possible decomposition. But in this case, what's nice, because it's a singleton alphabet, you essentially have a single case. And that single case is if you decompose w as u, uh, u, v, x, y, z, the only possible case is v, y together are a bunch of a's, let's say k a's, for k at least one, and at most m. Okay, so then the argument that I'm going to use should be should look very familiar, and the reason why it looks very familiar. Um, so uh, let's say I want to pump uh, up. So you could also pump down, but I'm going to use pump up because uh, it's going to be a bit easier for me to explain it. So I'm going to get w2. I'm essentially just going to add k a's to my already m square a. So I'm going to get a m square plus k. And now my goal is to show that this is not in L. But that's not in L if and only if uh, m square plus k does not equal to uh, p square uh, for any p uh, in the integers. So essentially m square plus k is not a perfect square. And you can show that m square plus k is not a perfect square by showing that it is between two consecutive uh, square numbers. Okay, so again, this should look familiar because uh, it is. So how do you uh, how do you show this? It's actually quite simple. You would just start with m square. You know that k is at least one, so uh, m square plus k is strictly greater than m square because you're at least adding one. You're at least adding one to m square. Uh, then, because k is at most m, you get that m square plus k is at most m squared plus m. And then you get that this is strictly less than m squared plus 2m uh, plus 1, which is equal to m plus 1 uh, squared. Okay. And so uh, this implies that m squared plus k is between two consecutive perfect squares. So that implies that m squared plus k is not equal to a perfect square, which implies that w2 is not an L. So then uh, that would lead to a uh, contradiction. So the, again, this is my symbol for contradiction. Uh, so contradiction occurred, uh, which implies that L is not uh, context free. Okay. So what I wanted you to notice from this exercise is that the exact same argument was done to show that uh, A n square is not regular. The exact same. So the only difference was for regularity, for non-regular, you had w as uh, x, y, z, but you still picked uh, you still picked your y as being a bunch of a's uh, or k a's, and then you would still pump up, and then this argument would be the same. So you would you would show that m squared plus k is not a perfect square. Okay, and so the the interesting and and important result that uh, that this illustrates is uh, it, and answers this question, which is the relation between uh, non-regular and non-context-free languages over a singleton alphabet is uh, if uh, the alphabet is a singleton, so it's a single symbol, and L is not uh, regular, then this immediately implies that L is not uh, context-free. Okay. So this is actually quite a powerful statement. 
And the intuition behind it, I'm not going to give it a formal proof. The intuition behind it is the argument, the pumping up or pumping down that you would give for uh, the pumping lemma for regular languages, the sort of the argument, uh, this kind of argument here, would be exactly the same for context-free languages. So then you know that if uh, your alphabet is a singleton and L is not regular, you can immediately uh, conclude that L is not uh, context-free. Okay, so that's the last thing I wanted to say for Turing machines, the video is already uh, uploaded. I actually double checked that it was. Uh, it's about 25 minutes long. Um, and uh, it should start to help you with uh, questions four and not really question five, but uh, question five or, or like when you need to use a Turing machine to compute a string, we're going to do that uh, in, the, in the last tutorial on Wednesday. So uh, question five, that'll be on, on Wednesday. But uh, uh, the extra material on Turing machines for the tutorial should give you an idea on how to solve uh, the questions in Q4. Okay, so um, uh, Vincent, for Turing machines, do we always start? Yes, yes. So um, let me just give you an illustration here. Uh, again, this is in the, the tutorial video, which uh, is published on the Moodle. But uh, this is your initial state. Your initial state is always going to start at the beginning of your string. Um, for a standard Turing machine, okay? So you can always make that assumption. Um, and, uh, and also actually in the video, uh, I, there was a typo here. Uh, the typo was here, I, we assumed that n was greater or equal to zero. Uh, but uh, it's not something that I mentioned, but Turing machines are not supposed to, or are not meant to accept the empty string. So really, uh, this should have been a strict uh, inequality. And the same goes for uh, the exercise here. Uh, this should have been a strict uh, inequality. But we, we fixed that. I think we, we should have fixed that. Yeah, that is fixed in the, um, uh, in the slides that have been posted. Uh, but just watch out for that if you look at the, the extra video. Okay, so uh, any other questions for um, assignment four or anything else? Um, yeah, so, yeah, let me, let me get to assignment four. So, yeah, here, uh, so what you're asking here is, is the greater or equal to zero. And also this guy here, lambda, uh, is, is part of the, the language. Um, so I, a Turing machine, it, it, there's no way that a Turing machine can accept the empty string. It's, it's physically, you can't create a transition for that to happen. Um, well, so, cause a Turing machine uh, accepts a string if it halts uh, in a state. So the Turing machine should, um, let me get the Turing machine back. Oh boy. Okay. All right, I have no idea where, oh, okay. There is. So um, the Turing machine uh, um, sort of accepts a string if it ends up in a uh, in a final state and the final state. So there's something about the final states is that uh, they should not have any outgoing transitions. Um, so it's hard for me, I guess you could do if you're in Q0 and you could see a blank, replace that with a blank and uh, I guess go to the right. Um, yeah, I guess that would work. Yeah, that, uh, yeah, or even left, left or right. Um, yeah, I think that would work actually. Um, so maybe double check with the, the professor, but I think that, that, that actually might be the, the answer. Uh, I was gonna say it's a typo, but I think if you, use, uh, if you use this kind of transition, I think that should work. But um, please double check with the professor. Yeah, please, thank you, Vincent. Um, and for, 
so Sophia for uh, Landa in a final yes. So uh, that's a good question. Um, so um, the question is here, we want to convert the grammar into Chomsky normal form. And we actually noticed that G uh, has the production rule S gives you Landa. Okay. So that means that L of G, uh, Landa is an L of G. Okay. Uh, but in the tutorials and also in the lectures, when we did the algorithm, uh, we assumed that L was not in L of G. So uh, what you should do, uh, what you should do because you want it, you want the, the final grammar to be equivalent, is you first uh, convert uh, into uh, CNF, uh, assuming, assuming lambda is not in L of G. And then at the end, you add uh, S gives you lambda. Okay, so uh, even though that doesn't technically, it's not in Chomsky anymore, uh, because you want the grammars to be equivalent, you should add uh, S gives you lambda. Okay, um, no problem. Okay, so um, yeah, any other questions? Um, I feel like that, that was probably the most, those are the most, um, burning ones, the burning questions, I guess. Um, so it doesn't seem like there are any others. Um, okay, so, um, well, I hope the, uh, the extra tutorial material uh, will help for the Turing machines, the creation. Uh, you're going to see that the examples are quite similar to the ones that you, so the ideas are the same as, as what you would use in the assignment. Uh, but we're going to do more more uh, Turing machine stuff on Wednesday, so you can uh, you can also get a better idea of how to do uh, a five. Um, so yeah, so um, uh, I guess I guess that's it. Um, I hope you have a, a nice a nice lecture, uh, and um, I'll see you Wednesday for for the uh, the final uh, tutorial and the the final lecture. All right, see you guys.